Hi, I'm Julie Rodriguez Widholm, Director of UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. In today's presentation, I explore the enduring influence of Frida Kahlo's groundbreaking paintings and drawings on contemporary art in the context of an exhibition I organized at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago in 2014, entitled Unbound Contemporary Art After Frida Kahlo. I'm pleased to share the ideas in anticipation of an extraordinary opportunity to see so many of Kahlo's paintings in the upcoming exhibition, Frida Kahlo Timeless at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art. Given the challenges and uncertainty of the last year, we may all take inspiration from Kahlo's resilience in the face of adversity. I hope you'll join me for a live Q&A after the talk. So how many of you would know who this was by looking at this image? It's kind of incredible how someone as complicated and contested as Mexican artist Frida Kahlo has become reduced to red lips, a unibrow, a dark updo, and colorful flowers in her hair. Somehow Frida Kahlo, arguably the world's most famous female artist, has become ubiquitous yet distanced from her truly radical work. Art historian Adriana Zavala has noted, quote, how the popular perception of Kahlo is so distant from who she was as a political person, as a member of the avant-garde, end quote. For a long time in recent decades, academics and curators didn't critically examine her work or take it seriously, while at the same time Mexican artists felt she was an oppressive symbol of stereotypical Mexican art overshadowing so many other artists. At the same time, since her death in 1954, she has become a commercial product. Here we see uh, an image of Salma Hayek portraying Frida Kahlo in the 2002 film Frida. Or another example, when I searched Frida Kahlo on Etsy, 19,000 results appeared um, from a variety of crafters making images and objects and jewelry and shoes bearing the likeness of Frida Kahlo. She's also all over social media. Hashtag Frida Kahlo brings up 2.8 million posts, many of which depict her image, um, phrases, um, sayings, inspirational quotes from her, and also people dressed as her. And then in 2017 at the Dallas Art Museum, they held Frida Fest and set a world record with a thousand people gathered as Frida Kahlo. Her image is so ubiquitous that she's even made it into children's books and movies. This is an image from Coco on the left and a book series um, depicting Frida Kahlo and her story for children. So this was the sort of context in 2013 when I started to think about um, how Frida Kahlo's image and her work were circulating in the art world, but also in culture at large. And I wanted to kind of change the narrative around Kahlo's work. Um, I thought she was so tied to, um, to Diego and, and the narrative of her, of her marriage to him. Um, I also thought we had gotten really far away from her paintings and her drawings, from her actual artwork. And so while I was a curator at MCA Chicago, I began to think about how uh, we might start to change the narrative around her work and how we consider her as an artist today and her legacy. Uh, the MCA Chicago was actually the first museum in the United States to give her a, a retrospective in 1978. And here you can see uh, a black and white image. At the time, um, in 1978, Ellen Arner, who was the art critic for the Chicago Tribune, uh, <laughs> wrote about the exhibition uh, in the following way. And I will read it aloud. Kahlo led the kind of life that makes for a Ms. Magazine version of the romantic agony. All of this shows up in her art, though after several miscarriages and medically ordered abortions, her primary subject became pain. Keeping in mind that Kahlo's works were created in a climate that was truly repressive to women, one can only marvel at the courage with which she presented all manner of grisly feminine experience. Yet while her consciously naive style depicts these horrors with uncommon directness, her psychological makeup was so intensely self-oriented that she was never capable of pulling back far enough to make a more general statement. 
By the time Kahlo began, begins painting herself in necklaces of thorns or with nails and arrows pe piercing her skin, one realizes that this has become an art of monumental self-pity, an art that will satisfy none but the most caterwauling feminist. And this is also why I thought it was time to revisit the work uh, from a distinctly 21st century perspective. I wanted to bring the focus back on her paintings to change the narrative of her always being considered through the details of her biography and her husband, Diego Rivera, a very famous Mexican muralist, to move beyond the surface of her persona and to contextualize her within contemporary art and not just early 20th century Mexico. I began to organize this exhibition in 2013, and it was on view at MCA Chicago in May to October 2014, and I organized this with curatorial fellow Abigail Winograd. You may wonder why the list of artists um, or the group of artists I'm about to share with you were chosen over others, and it's important to mention that this exhibition was based in works from the MCA collection to trace themes found in Kahlo's work. So this is not necessarily a talk about Frida Kahlo's paintings and work themselves. I will be uh, speaking more about other artists' work, uh, but I do think it, it's um, important to um, kind of share that she is the fulcrum and, and, and there are two particular works in the exhibition that were in the 1978 solo exhibition that kind of formed the centerpiece and then we built uh, kind of constellations of themes around them. So although Kahlo was relatively unknown in the US before her death, her popularity has grown enormously since then. Her celebrity fed by the dramatic nature of her biography often diverts attention from the confrontational and transgressive nature of her paintings and undermines the revolutionary intent of her work. Many of the themes Kahlo introduced, in particular her subversion of accepted notions of gender, sexuality, social class, and ethnicity, prophetically anticipated late 20th century and early 21st century cultural concerns, such as post-colonialism, feminism, civil rights, multiculturalism, and globalization. As I mentioned, using two of the paintings included in the MCA's 1978 exhibition, Unbound, Contemporary Art After Frida Kahlo, brought Kahlo's work into a dialogue with contemporary art. The artists in the exhibition share Kahlo's rebellious spirit and challenge the predominance of straight white male voices by insisting on the presence of multiple perspectives in contemporary art. In particular, the exhibition investigates how, like Kahlo, Artists from the last 30 years explore themes such as the performance of gender, national identities, the political body, and the absent or traumatized body. These artists owe much to Kahlo paving the way for them. There are also no Frida Kahlo paintings in Chicago museums, so it's actually quite rare to be able to see them on public display. She only produced around 200 works in her lifetime, and those largely remain in museum collections and within Mexico, where they cannot be sold due to strict cultural heritage laws. Only paintings that are in the US that were exported before the 1960s or were painted here in the US when Frida was traveling with Diego to California, Detroit, or Chicago are available. These two are in a private collection in Chicago, and as I mentioned, were part of the original 1978 retrospective. So a little bit more on these two particular paintings that form the fulcrum of the, the thematic fulcrum for the exhibition. On the left, you have La Vanadita, the little deer from 1946. Here you can see that Kahlo frequently depicted herself with male and female attributes. In this painting, Kahlo presented herself in the guise of a stag whose body is pierced by nine arrows. The antlers on a woman's head suggest the presence of both male and female characteristics in a single body. She also combined religious symbolism, religious symbolism associated with Christianity. For example, the body pierced with arrows alludes to the martyrdom of St. Sebastian, pre-Columbian religions, and Buddhism. So here, Kahlo painted a multicultural universe where gender operates across a spectrum of possibilities. The painting on the right 
Arbol de Esperanza, de la Esperanza, Tree of Hope, from also from 1946, is a portrait of strength and resistance at a time of physical suffering. Describing the scene in a letter to the work's patron, Kahlo wrote, the landscape is the day and night and death that flees terrified in the face of my own will to live. Kahlo holds a flag with the words from a song she often repeated, tree of hope, keep firm. Kahlo's figure, wearing the traditional clothing of women from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Oaxaca, Mexico, embodies resistance against conservative academic traditions of Mexican art and solidarity with Mexico's indigenous folk traditions. This double self-portrait also represents dualities, such as the sun and moon, being clothed and being naked, being upright and recumbent, and being strong and being wounded. So in terms of the four kind of sections of the exhibition, the four themes that we were tracing stemming from what we were seeing in these uh, paintings, we begin with performing gender. So Kahlo not only transgressed gender norms, frequently depicting herself with her signature unibrow and visible mustache, but also transcended the male-female dichotomy altogether by combining elements of both in paintings such as La Vanadita. This prescient perspective made Kahlo a symbol of fearless individuality and an icon to some in the feminist and LGBTQ communities, as well as a forebear to many contemporary artists who address the performance and fluidity of gender identity. The works in this section raise questions about gender. Which characteristics do we interpret as feminine or masculine? Do we expect a certain kind of work from a male or female artist? Does gender exist on a spectrum between male and female? And I will note, we were organizing this show in 2013, and I think it's clear that the conversations around this, um, this kind of false binary of, of male, female um, gender uh, has become very prominent in the culture. And we would probably ask different questions now that we know there is a spectrum of, of gender identity. So here you can see some of the, uh, an installation shot from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Uh, this is the section on performing gender. We included Martin Soto Clement, Louise Bourgeois, Thomas Hausago, and Wengechi Mutu. In many ways, playing with the notions of duality. In the Thomas Hausago, you can see this figure in two parts, um, kind of a, the front and the back. Uh, here we have on the left a photograph by Jack Pearson, who was part of a group of artists, including Nan Golden, who studied in uh, Boston in the early 80s, and generally photographed their friends and immediate surroundings. Pearson is known for his intimate portraits of young gay men, and in this piece called The Callback, Pearson captures a friend dressed as Lucille Ball, standing in the shade of a palm tree, bathed in the diffused California sunlight. The young man in the image embodies a nostalgic longing for the beauty and glamour of old Hollywood's female stars. And then on the right, we have two images from Nan Golden, B in a chevron sweater as Blonde Venus from 1972 and On the Beach, Boston from 1973. And Nan Golden is known for documenting the lives of her friends and family in photographs since the 1970s. Her work was groundbreaking for its honest portrayal of the lives of individuals and communities who existed outside of traditional family structures and gender divisions. These photographs record moments in the lives of her transgender friends. In describing Golden's work, art historian Walter Keller said, Nan Golden reminds us that identity is not a condition, but rather is, if, was, if one must put it into words, a permanent search. We also included a work on, by Lorna Simpson on the left. She, from 1992, a rather iconic piece in which she juxtaposed text and image to complicate the meaning of what we see. So while the work's title names a female subject, the dress and posture of the figure imply that, quote unquote, she is male, dressed as male, typically male. The unusual cropping of the image draws the viewer's attention to the subject's hand gestures and their relative proximity to the crotch, another site of a biological sex differentiation. And then on the right, Julio Galan, a Mexican artist, 
uh, born in 1958, passed in 2006. Uh, this painting from 2004 is a self-portrait in which he painted himself with the words, death will die when we come to life, written across his body. So Mexico's gay rights movement, which emerged in the 70s and the AIDS ep epidemic in the 80s, introduced issues of sexual identity and into public conversation in a very um, conservative society. Here in this piece, in this beautiful painting, he exposed his body and his sexuality in defiance of prevailing social norms. For Galan, the many, uh, uh, like many of the neo-Mexicanist painters, Kahlo was an influential figure in her unabashed explorations of gender and sexuality. And here you can see a detail of Lorna Simpson and Julio Galan. So the next theme I will explore is contesting national identity. So Frida Kahlo very strongly identified as Mexican and was part of the Mexican nationalist movement, which promoted indigenous culture um, after the Mexican revolution. In contrast today, or I should say, you know, in 2013, 2014, um, but ongoing, uh, many contemporary artists working and living internationally often question the relevance of national identity. They seek to be defined by their work and not political borders. Yet globalization demands a negotiation between the local and the international, which the work in this section explored. And I think this is another interesting uh, moment of reflection as we think about how national identities um, continue to you know, play a political role and how artists um, identify or, or don't with their national identities. And in particular, I'm thinking of um, uh, really the wonderful book on Latinx uh, art that just came out and pointed to within Latinx artists, there is generally a distinction between those that are Latin American and have a strong national identity uh, versus those who are based in the United States. So I think if we were to consider this section through the lens of 2021 conversation and dialogue, that would certainly be part of it. But here, uh, again, using works from the MCA collection, thinking about uh, how I had observed so many artists really pushing against notions of national identity as the foremost signifier of, of who they are and, and many artists who transcended nationalities. So we had work by Francis Elise, um, Gabriela Orozco, Nelson Lerner, who's Brazilian, um, Francis Elise. So on the, on the left, Francis Elise had actually, um, he's an international, internationally recognized artist, had hired Enrique Huerta, a Mexican sign painter, um, to incorporate imagery from street advertisements in the neighborhood where they live. So Francis Elise would produce a painting and give it to Huerta and other rotolistas, sign painters, to create their own version of the image. After they made several copies, Elise created new paintings by compiling the most significant variations between the original images and the reproductions. So this kind of blurring the lines of authorship as well as distinct, distinctions between fine and commercial art uh, were significant. Uh, Belgian by birth, Elise moved to Mexico City in the mid eighties and was part of the generation of artists from Mexico City who rose to prominence in the global art market of the 1990s. Elise is routinely associated with Mexico, although both his background and his appropriation of, a lo of local Mexican aesthetics in his own work raises questions about the very idea of nationality and considerations of art in the age of globalization. And I would also add, you know, as we um, enter much more into dialogue around uh, racial justice, social justice, and um, privilege, you know, I think one could certainly reconsider that relationship between Francis Alice and uh, Enrique Huerta in this context. Gabriela Orozco made this small piece in the center of the Mexican flag. He uh, calls multiple cities home, dividing his time among Mexico City, New York, Paris. He belongs to a generation of artists whose practices challenge the limitations of national identity. His flag series reflects upon the traditional signifiers of nationality, in this case, the Mexican flag. Um, 
and uses readily available materials such as cardboard. Uh, he makes the flag more democratic and with a circle punched through the center more open. Uh, the piece on the right by Nelson Lerner uh, is untitled from the series Right You Are If You Think You Are from 2003. And in this series, he used maps to comment on issues of national identity, globalization, and colonialism. Untitled draws attention to the consequences of globalization by blanketing the map in images drawn from popular culture. The difficulties experienced by colonial societies in Central America, South America, Africa, and Asia are symbolically represented by skeletons and skulls. In contrast, the North is covered in figures from popular culture such as Santa Claus and Mickey Mouse. The other artists featured in this section about contesting national identity include Elio Oitisica, Angel Otero, and Beatriz Miliazic. Um, Elio Oitisica was a Brazilian artist who passed in 1980. His Medish Gemma's work, these kind of geometric abstractions, um, he made a series, primarily made in the 1940s and 50s. This series of 350 works on cardboard featured geometric forms and primary colors although he was inspired by European abstraction, which typically incorporated geometric shapes and followed a grid, Oitisica juxtaposed irregular shapes and colors to suggest movement and instability. His strategy was in keeping with Brazilian poet Oswaldo de Andrade's 1928 theory of cultural cannibalism, which encouraged artists to absorb the practices of Western art and digest them to produce work specific to Brazilian culture. The sculpture in the center is by Angel Otero, originally from Puerto Rico, now based in New York. And this towering precarious sculpture could be considered a metaphor for the instability of national identity. Its combination of broken porcelain and ornate iron fences are allusions to common materials from the artist's native Puerto Rico, suggesting how the local and international, the personal and universal are brought together in contemporary art. And on the right, Beatriz Miliazic, Le Blonde 6 from 2004, this piece um, by Beatriz, who lives in Rio de Janeiro, combined candy wrappers and cut paper to produce the shape of a flower. The title of her painting, Le Blanc, is the name of the most affluent neighborhood in Rio and a brand of cachaça, a local liquor made from fermented sugar cane, that is used to make the national cocktail, the caipirinha. The artist has explained, quote, I was always trying to bring together, quote, high art painting with elements from my own culture here in Brazil. And so here, these artists kind of exemplify a kind of cultural mixing. Uh, and, the, and, and Frida Kahlo certainly, on one hand, was uh, a fervent nationalist, but she also had, um, had traveled internationally and was very well connected in social circles in the US and in Europe. Next, the political body. Uh, as a communist and Mexican nationalist, Kahlo ardently believed in the power of art to speak truth to power and often used her work as a platform to express her political beliefs. The artists in this section share her interest in political issues and use their work to critique historical injustice and oppression. Here, bodies are understood as contested political sites because of the ways government control or exploit them. Thus, they can be a potent symbol of injustices linked to slavery, civil rights, gender, and race. Uh, one of the most, I think, kind of brilliant pieces in the MCA collection is this 1998 video, Turbulent, from Shirin Nashat, an Iranian artist. So Shirin Nashat's video and photographic work explore the social, political, and psychological dimensions of women's experience in Iran. Turbulent addresses the social segregation of men and women and the transcendent power of music. Islamic law forbids women to sing before a public audience. Here, a man sings a conventional love song written by the mystic poet Rumi before an audience of men while the, women, while the woman performs to an empty auditorium. The use of her voice is an act of rebellion. So this, it's a two screen projection. Eugenio Ditborn is a Chilean artist, and this is a piece entitled Dust Clouds, Airmail Painting 90, Number 99 from 1992. 
and he began his airmail paintings in 1982 during the dictatorship of August, Augusto Pinochet. The paintings condemned the Chilean government's political repression, torture, and murder of indigenous peoples and political dissidents. Ditborn mailed his work in envelopes to be exhibited abroad, thereby circumventing the censorship and dangers associated with political dissent while simultaneously circulating hidden truths to the outside world. The work combines found images of dead bodies from three different archival sources. Ditborn wrote, quote, dust clouds main purpose is to exhibit the sacrificed and mummified dead, the beaten and knocked out, besides the empty objects that might contain them. The meeting between them doesn't happen in the work, but we do it. We bury, wrap, lift, and raise them. And finally, we put them into those objects to lie there and rest. This grouping also included work by Donald Moffat and Sanford Biggers. Donald Moffat's work on the left, Texas, 1969, a work from 2001, is part of a series of three, and Donald Moffat highlighted Barbara Jordan's isolation and importance as the only African American and the only woman in the Texas State Legislature from 1967 to 72. Barbara Jordan was the first African American to be elected to the Texas State Senate, and later the first Southern African American woman to be elected to the US House of Representatives. Texas 1969 draws attention to the history of racial exclusion in the South while celebrating a pivotal figure in American history. On the right, Sanford Biggers, uh, uh, an American artist, um, this work is Quilt, number 24 from 2013. And in, in this work, Biggers repurposes historical materials such as 19th century quilts he receives from either the descendants of slaves or slave owners and photographs to draw attention to America's legacy of racism. In this work, the artist added vertical and horizontal stripes of white flowered fabric in the shape of a window to the original quilt, and then spray painted it with the silhouette of a runaway slave immortalized in the scourged back. This 1863 photograph was widely distributed in abolitionist circles as proof of the degradations and cruelties of slavery. And last in this section, we have uh, a work by Dora Salcedo with Jose Angelo Reno. Dora Salcedo is a well-known Colombian artist. This, since the late 1980s, Dora Salcedo has addressed the sorrow and loss caused by the violence of civil war in Colombia and around the world. While each project is rooted in specific testimonies of individual experiences that she has carefully researched, Salcedo's ambiguous sculptures evoke a shared experience of loss. On the left, Salcedo combines and reshapes domestic items, such as wardrobes, tables, and chairs to create dysfunctional objects. The artist has explained, quote, it is always the idea of something that is common, that we all recognize, turned into something that has undergone a process that is obviously violent, end quote. These sculptures evoke the damage done by violence and the contradictions inherent in survival when life continues but is unbearable. On the right, Jose Angela Reno's piece, Untitled Hangman, from the Serie Vermelia Militaris, 2003. In this series, Jose Angela Reno's source materials were donated, purchased, and found, <clears throat> uh, and found portrait photographs from all over the world that feature individuals, not necessarily soldiers, dressed in military or military-inspired clothing. Using a computer, she retouched the images and saturated them with red. This process emphasized their associations with blood and violence while simultaneously obscuring the outline of the figure. Moving on to the absent or traumatized body, the last section in the exhibition, the body, particularly an idealized female nude as an object for the male gaze, has been an artistic subject for thousands of years. Kahlo challenged this history of representation through her honest portrayals of her own body in physical and emotional distress. The artists in this gallery, including Ana Mendieta, Gabriela Orozco, Catherine Opie, and Valesca Suarez, also subvert traditional representations of the body by completely removing it or only leaving a trace of its presence. Catherine Opie, Felix Gonzalez Torres, and Jose Leon Nielsen address the effects of AIDS on the body. 
Their works created during the height of the AIDS epidemic poetically consider the personal toll of the disease in gay communities in North, Central, and South America. So here's sort of an installation shot of um, um, Cindy Sherman, Gabriela Orozco, Ana Mendieta, Catherine Opie. On the left is an image of the work by uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, entitled The End from 1990. And this piece consists of sheets of paper that museum visitors may take away. Because his artworks often circulated outside the gallery, Felix Gonzalez Torres likened them to a virus. He said, quote, you have a show and everyone's walking out of the show with your work and it's kind of painful, but at the same time, it was a rehearsal for me, learning to let go, end quote. Gonzalez Torres witnessed AIDS take the life of his longtime companion. Many of his works are poetic med meditations on the meaning of loss, death, and the transient nature of human life. On the right is a very large color Polaroid um, uh, by Catherine Opie entitled In Memory, Lee Bowery from 2000. This portrait commemorates the legendary gay nightclub performer Lee Bowery who died of AIDS in 1994. It was commissioned by the Estate Project for Artists with AIDS in 2000 and is, and is one of a series of 13 images that Catherine Opie created using the largest Polaroid camera available. During his lifetime, Bowery used his body as sculpture in performances that feature elaborate costumes. Opie's portrait of an empty chair draped in one of Bowery's cloaks uses her subject's absence to memorialize his loss. Opie's series refers to historical traditions of portrait painting while creating romantic and dignified portrayals of socially marginalized subjects. And here, Cindy Sherman on the left, untitled 153 from 1985. Dressed in costume and elaborately theatrical tableau, Cindy Sherman photographs herself to explore the construction of identity and the representation of women. The violence suggested by this image forces the viewer to confront the real problem of violence against women. Sherman has said of this work, quote, you can be terrified and screaming and hiding your eyes, but you're laughing the worse it is, the image it is, because it's just so over the top and cathartic to confront these things that are really disturbing. And it's okay in this case because they're fakes. On the right, Ana Mendieta's, uh, one of uh, a few pieces from her Silhouette series from the mid to late 1970s. And here, Ana Mendieta, I will quote um, from Ana Mendieta uh, from 1981. She says, I have been carrying out a dialogue between the landscape and the female body based on my own silhouette. I believe this has been a direct result of my having been torn from my homeland, Cuba, during my adolescence. I'm overwhelmed by the feeling of having been cast from the womb, parentheses, nature. My art is the way I reestablish the bonds that unite me to the universe. It is a return to the maternal source. Through my earth body sculptures, I become one with the earth. I become an extension of nature and nature becomes an extension of my body. This obsessive act of reasserting my ties with the earth is really the reactivation of primeval beliefs. In an omnipresent female force, the after image of being encompassed within the womb." End quote. And when, you know, we know uh, Frida Kahlo was made quite a bit of work about the womb and, and her inability to uh, have children. And so, so that was the, um, those were the works in the absent or traumatized body section. And I just want to mention that if I were to organize the show today in a different time, you know, so much has happened culturally, socially in, in this country since 2013, 2014, I would certainly consider additional themes and, and, and aspects of the work that we didn't consider originally or we didn't have room to consider. I mean, each of the each of the sections honestly could have been its own exhibition, um, but we wanted to show the a variety of ways in which Frida Kahlo's work was so radically prescient in the concerns of work from the last um, 50 plus years. So if I were to organize the show today, I would consider Kahlo's traumatic relationship to motherhood since she was unable to bear children and made paintings of her 1932 miscarriage in Detroit. 
the pictures, the images I'm depicting here were not in our exhibition, but I'm showing them for reference. Um, you know, a, a subject that wasn't seen as serious in the art world, right? So motherhood, um, the, the sort of trauma of, of trying to conceive um, just hasn't been really taken seriously in the art world and, and is finally beginning to gain more visibility. I would also consider how Frida Kahlo openly depicted and addressed her physical disabilities and the role that plays in our current conversations around disability activism in the arts. And lastly, I would, um, you know, I think her work prompts very interesting debates about the construction and performance of identity, in particular, the indigenous identities and aesthetics, the clothing, craft, cultural heritage of the Oaxacan women of the matriarchal society of Tehuantepec that she adopted, some may say appropriated, uh, if we apply the lens of contemporary culture and notions of privilege. And that's where I think perhaps I'm, uh, you know, the, the, the questions of um, an artist's legacy and how we, how we interpret work, how we view work, how we view, um, how we view, well, I guess just how we view work changes, right, through time and the, and the cultural moment we are in. Um, and so actually, I, I, I find it fascinating to revisit exhibitions from years past to see how the curatorial choices we made at the time were germane to the questions in the culture then, and how now, you know, um, gosh, seven years later, we have new and different questions. And so I think Frida Kahlo, though her work obviously hasn't changed <laughs> um, at all, the meaning we find in it, the relevance, the questions, the problematics that we find in it do change over time and, and continue to be rather fascinating. And you know, her, her legacy persists and if, if not even, um, if not even grows exponentially, right? I think the interest in her work ha has really uh, grown over the last several years. And, and I did a quick count and it seems that there have been 50, about 50 exhibitions uh, about her since 2014. And uh, there are a lot of exhibitions that kind of depict her through photography that have her clothing, kind of the artifact evidence of her home, uh, the Casa Azul. Um, a lot of exhibitions include her and Diego Rivera and other muralists and Mexican modernists. Um, and I'm, ex I'm particularly excited about this exhibition at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art because it will allow us to see uh, uh, some of her paintings that, that have not been seen outside of Mexico very frequently. And I'll mention that while some of the artists I discussed today openly attribute Frida Kahlo as opening up doors to them for new and difficult conversations in art, others have simply benefited from her transgressive and radically personal subjects. Other artists have taken up the mantle of cultivating an artistic persona, much like she did as well. And what I kind of in conclusion want, want, want to say is that we can't deny that she, a queer bohemian communist nationalist revolutionary woman, um, from Mexico with a disability is one of the most important artists of the 20th century, whose impact on contemporary art and at her place within a global art history needs to be better understood as the number of exhibitions about her and her work rapidly prol proliferate. She becomes an icon of fiercely independent personal expression in the face of trauma. And let's not forget about the enduring significance of her singular paintings and legacy as a visual artist, whose courage to speak her truth paved the way for so many artists who followed in her wake. Thank you very much. <laughs>